Um, depending who you choose to read or believe, the ancient Greeks recognised four, six, or seven different kinds of love. Uh, they have agape, which is altruistic care and concern, unselfish concern for others. Philia, love and loyalty for family and friends. Storge, which is a more asymmetrical kind of love, like a parent for a child, where you don't expect it to be reciprocated. Um, and then, according to other authorities, there, there's three more, or three or four more. There's ludus, playful love, no strings attached with the emphasis on fun. There's pragma, pragmatic love based on uh, shared goals and a willingness to find a way forward. And philousia, self-love, not necessarily narcissism or egotism, at its best, healthy um, self-esteem and self-confidence. Uh, and then, of course, there's, there's the, the last one that everyone knows exists, eros, sexual or passionate love, which the Greeks believed was a kind of madness uh, brought about by Cupid's arrow. <laughs> I've been teaching and performing improv for over 10 years, and I've gradually come to the conclusion that improv at its best is indistinguishable from love. Uh, think about these. Unselfish care, loyalty, uh, parental-type concern, playful fun, willingness to make it work somehow, uh, the confidence to step forward and be seen. Think of the best improv groups you've either been in or seen or worked with. Think of the best shows you've performed in or watched. None of them could have reached the pinnacle they did without drawing on these six kinds of love. Um, the only one that's left out there is Eros, and, and what you do between shows is frankly none of my business. Um, what's any of this got to do with applied improvisation? Well, if improv is like love, one of the tenets of love is we're supposed to love unconditionally without wishing to change our beloved. Uh, we all know that relationships where one tries to change the other doesn't really work. And yet, as applied improvisers, we're asked to go into organizations specifically to bring about change, to go in and use the power of the six kinds of love that we've learned to embody and wield it to bring about change because somebody's not happy with the way things are. And I've, I've been puzzling with this dilemma. And, and I think I, I, I might have found a solution to it. Um, my life partner is a gestalt psychotherapist. And she introduced me to the paradoxical theory of change. Um, it's outlined in a paper written in 1970 by Arnold Beyser. Um, and he postulates that you can't... Well, this is what he says. Change occurs when one becomes what he is not when he tries to become what he is not. Now, he was writing in the 70s when people were less concerned about pronouns, so let, we'll just render this into something more acceptable for today. Change occurs when one becomes what one is, not when one tries to become what one is not. What he was saying is you can't bring about change in yourself and, or somebody else through willpower, manipulation, or coercion. He says change comes about when you invest the time the effort and the energy to truly become what you already are, to recognize your true inner self and the circumstances that you are in, or what we applied improvisers would call saying a big yes to the current reality. Um, up to that point, he's been talking about personal uh, and uh, individual change in therapy. Sorry, I left out this bit. He says it's only by rejecting the role of change agent we actually make meaningful and orderly change possible. Um, but he then goes on to say that he believes that this same change theory applies not only to individuals, but to social systems. And social systems, of course, is exactly what we applied improvisers deal in. And he says uh, he divides the process up into three stages of bringing about paradoxical organisational change. Step one, he says, it requires, and this is his language, that the system become conscious of alienated fragments within and without, uh, which I take to mean some bits of the company aren't playing nicely with other bits. How do we bring about that realisation? Well, in a first applied improv session, uh, I will play some silly games that are fun, 
but with careful debrief and gentle facilitation and lack of blame, can start to surface some of the behaviours that get in the way of good teamwork. Behaviours including, not necessarily limited to, refusing to participate, uh, ridiculing others, ego protection, um, caution through fear, over-caution through fear, long pauses while seeking perfection, wanting to dominate or control others, um, wanting to win and make everybody else a loser. I'm sure we've all seen these behaviours when we've played, applied improv games. Uh, with conversation, with facilitation, you can gradually get people to realise uh, that some of these behaviours also manifest in the company itself and has an impact. Um, I was working last week with a bunch of civil servants who are not the easiest people, necessarily. And one uh, guy who was quite high up in his department, every time we played a game, uh, he wanted to stop it, clarify the rules, check what the outcomes we were seeking was for, um, ask me to be more specific, why are we doing this? And later on, when I um, invited them to... I asked him the question, what have you noticed in yourself through the playing of these games? He went, I think I'm quite picky. <laughs> Which I thought was a brilliant revelation, a great bit of, of self-insight. Uh, stage two then says, um, Beza, that uh, the fragmentation is accepted as a legitimate outgrowth of a functional need. That's his language again. Um, what I think, say is, whatever's going on isn't happening by accident. There's a reason for these behaviours. And again, from Gestalt, I've learnt a term, uh, creative adjustment, which refers to the strategies we learn to thrive and survive in the environment we find ourselves in, usually as a child. So a child, perhaps, who has tantrums and is punished for having tantrums might learn in future life never to express emotion, even if that's not helpful uh, in, as, as they grow up. And so, like, likewise, in an organisation, um, an employee perhaps who has shortcut a bit of company procedure to help a colleague or, or a customer might get punished for that and decide from then on they're going to rigidly follow policy, they're going to rigidly follow protocol, no matter what the cost for goodwill or, or, or the company. And, and again, through conversation and facilitation, we can start to acknowledge that the company culture itself might start bringing about some of these behaviours. And, and my picky civil servant said, it's not just me, actually my whole department are picky. As soon as somebody has an idea or has a presentation, we all just try and poke as many holes in it as we can as quickly as possible. Uh, I think everyone's just trying to prove how clever they are. Uh, and then the third stage is, again, Beze, this leads to communication with other subsystems and facilitates an integrated, harmonious development of the whole system. Or, as I like to say, an honest, open, organisation-wide conversation about the reality of the current situation. Or possibly a big yes to what's going on. And only then, says Beze, can the company start um, to recognise its true self, what's really going on, and that's when change might start to happen. Uh, he offers us even more. He says... And this is a long one. Confronted with a pluralistic, multifaceted, changing system, we must find an approach to... I'm going to read this off the... To move dynamically and flexibly with the times while still maintaining some central gyroscope to guide us, which I've translated as organisations like people need to be grounded but flexible, well-organised but responsive to the fast-changing world we find ourselves in. And, and I know of nothing better to teach that kind of flexibility than applied improvisation with our, with our core values of staying in the present, saying yes, responding with our authentic selves, recognising the value of group mind. Uh, I think it's a matchless tool for bringing about change, the kind of paradoxical change that Bayser is talking about where we embrace what's already there and build upon it. Um, I, I love that. I, I actually love it six different ways. <laughs> um, uh, if you want to talk to me more about it, come and find me later. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>